Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. A Tennessee Radio Shack reopens and partners with a local ham radio club. Lots of FCC actions this week, including doing away with the main studio rule for broadcast stations and the updating of many reporting and notification requirements. Also, the FCC scraps the telegraphy regulations in a massive rules overhaul. The communications interoperability training with amateur radio is set to take place next month. New amateur bands spring to life, but a veteran LF experimenter is denied access to 2,200 meters. The Caribbean Telecommunications Union head is calling for a new generation of hams. A microwatt signal on the LF bands makes it across the Atlantic. The FCC is not happy with a pirate broadcaster in Alabama. Meanwhile, the ARRL November sweepstakes is almost here. And the Trump administration has announced the drone integration pilot program. We will tell you all about it, along with a look at operating the terahertz spectrum. And we will have this week's propagation forecast all coming up next in this week's special expanded edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will discuss two-factor identification and the latest on the Wi-Fi security flaw. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, will tell us what you should pack for a contest. And we will have the first of a two-part talk given at the 2017 Dayton Hamvention by Mitch Stern, W1SJ, on operating pointers for the new ham. That's all straight ahead as Special Expanded Edition number 974 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and sitting in the lead anchor chair, hey, this is really nice upholstery. I could get used to this. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, on a gorgeous sunny late October afternoon, I would rather be outside, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Syracuse, New York, where there's a nip in the air. Boy, does it feel like fall. I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the western Catskills of New York State, home of Rip Van Winkle, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. Coming to you from our Central Florida News Bureau in Studio 1A, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox, 2 Fox. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. The Citizen Tribune newspaper in Tennessee recently reported that a newly reopened Radio Shack store in Jefferson City has partnered with the Lakeway Amateur Radio Club to offer licensing classes. Manager Reed Frears also created a new addition to the store, which he has described as the maker's space, the newspaper said. The open area of the store will be home to classes in such subjects as soldering, using drones, setting up a Facebook page, and configuring and using a smartphone. These types of programs were dropped by Radio Shack years ago, Frears told the newspaper. Now we have the opportunity to bring them back. We have to get to the next generation. Radio Shack will die out if we don't get to them. The bankrupt Radio Shack has closed its company-owned retail outlets. Frears' store was among the last to go dark. He was given the opportunity to reopen as a franchise store, and he purchases his stock from a Radio Shack distribution center. The head of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union has called for a new generation of hams. In remarks made on International Disaster Reduction Day, Friday, October 13th, Caribbean Telecommunications Union Secretary General Bernadette Lewis described amateur radio as a bedrock of sustained communications during emergencies and strongly suggested cultivating a new and younger generation of radio amateurs to carry this role forward. 
She spoke as part of a panel on emergency telecommunications during the International Telecommunication Union World Telecommunication Development Conference 2017, now underway in Buenos Aires, Argentina. The CTU, she said, has been considering the role of amateur radio in light of this very, very violent hurricane season. Amateur radio has been a staple, and it's because of the amateur radio operators in the region that we get a lot of information that we need, she told her audience. Her presentation defined amateur radio as one component of the coordination of preparedness, response, and recovery effort on the part of national emergency management agencies. Moderator Vanessa Gray later asked Lewis what one concrete step could be taken to make better use of information and communication technologies for disaster management. Amateur radio has been the bedrock of sustained communications during such emergencies, she continued, and one of the things we are looking at is actually facilitating this process of having a network of disaster resistance centers that, in times when you don't have a disaster, could be used for training new operators and generating that interest across the region. Lewis of Trinidad and Tobago reiterated her remarks in condensed form during a subsequent interview in which she called hurricanes a fact of life for Caribbean countries and suggested that hurricane-devastated countries need to think carefully about how to rebuild their infrastructure to make it less prone to storm damage. WTDC-17, which continues through October 20th, considers topics, projects, and programs relevant to telecommunication development. The conference theme this year is ICT for Sustainable Development Goals. ARRL Technical Relations Specialist John Siverling, WB3ERA, and International Amateur Radio Union Secretary Rod Stafford, W6ROD, are attending. The FCC on Tuesday made another push towards modernizing rules governing the broadcast industry by voting to eliminate the requirement that radio and TV stations must maintain main studios in their communities of license. A local phone number is all that will be needed in the near future for broadcasters in their community of license. In a 3-2 vote, the Federal Communications Commission has approved the reversal of the 1939 decision that has required stations to operate a main studio within 25 miles of a station's city of license. The commission said the change gives broadcasters more flexibility in a new digital age that allows those in a community to engage stations via social media and email. It has also done away with the requirement that the main studio have full-time management and staff present during normal business hours. The trade-off for that flexibility is a dictate that will be easily fulfilled by the phone company. The FCC says any station that moves out of its city of license will need to maintain a local telephone number in their community of license or else have a toll-free number. Supporters of the measure believe that the current rule was burdensome and inefficient and no longer served the public interest. The FCC has been collecting comments on ways to modernize media regulations to eliminate and modify rules that are outdated and burdensome. Opponents scoffed that broadcasters who often preach about the value of localism push to remove a rule intended to uphold the concept. The overwhelming majority of public input favored our proposal. The record shows that main studios are no longer needed to enable broadcasters to be responsive to their communities of license. That's because the public these days is much more likely to interact with stations, including accessing stations' public files online. Additionally, technology allows broadcast stations to produce local news even without a nearby studio, Pai said. The date the rule change takes effect will be set once the decision is published in the Federal Register. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. We are days away from the month of November, and that means two of the biggest ARRL contests are nearly upon us. For many, the ARRL November sweepstakes mark the beginning of the fall operating season, with the lure of a clean sweep being the ultimate goal. 
The challenge of sweepstakes is to work as many stations in as many of the 83 ARRL and Radio Amateurs of Canada sections as possible within the 24 available hours. Sweepstakes take place on separate November weekends. The CW weekend is November 4th through 6th, and the phone or SSB weekend is November 18th through 20. The contest period for each contest begins at 2100 UTC on Saturday and continues through 0259 UTC on Monday. Remember that the shift back to standard time occurs during the CW weekend. There is an important change to the contest rules this year. All logs must be submitted five days after each event. Sweepstakes is a domestic contest with broad appeal, and even stations with modest equipment and antennas can enjoy success. Many stations like to operate in the QRP category with output of 5 watts or less. For those hoping to break one of the current scoring records, there's a high bar. For example, N2IC in New Mexico holds the single operator high power record with 255,520 points set in 2009. The single operator low power record of 213,144 points was set in 2015 by W2GD operating KP2M in the U.S. Virgin Islands. The single operator QRP record of 173,168 was set in 2002 by N6TR operating W5WMU in Louisiana. Some ARRL and RAC sections are considered tough ones to work for a clean sweep. The often elusive Northern Territories multiplier will be on the air this year, however, as Jerry Hull, W1VE, takes the helm of VY1AAA, remotely operating the station of J. Allen, VY1JA, in Yukon Territory. Power remains out over much of Puerto Rico, so this section may turn out to be extremely rare. However, a few Puerto Rican amateurs have indicated that they are determined to get into the game. A new proposal from the FCC aims to reduce regulatory burdens on broadcasters with an update to two rules. The first update would allow broadcasters to notify the public of license applications through the internet rather than through newspapers and over-the-air announcements as is required under current rules. The FCC is also seeking comment on whether its broadcast application public notice rule should be eliminated. The FCC has also proposed to no longer require certain TV broadcasters to file annual reports about ancillary or supplementary service. These are services that some broadcasters provide using their spectrum in addition to their over-the-air TV programming, like subscription video and data transmission service. The proposal would require broadcasters that earn revenue from the provision of ancillary or supplementary services which would require a fee payment to the FCC to file annual reports. This is consistent with the FCC's responsibility to report to Congress annually on the amount of fees collected from those broadcasters per the Commission. The FCC describes these proposals as part of its Modernization of Media Regulation Initiative. These Notice of Proposed Rulemakings were approved by Chairman Ajit Pai and Commissioners O'Reilly, Carr, and Rosenworcel, Commissioner Clyburn approved in part and concurred in part. All commissioners are expected to issue statements on the proposal. The FCC is scrapping rules on telegraphs, even though no carriers no longer exist. This as part of the Trump administration's effort to slash regulations at the Federal Communications Commission. The last Western Union telegram in the United States was sent in 2006, and the commission had stopped enforcing the rules in 2013. The last major telegram service worldwide ended in India in 2013. The FCC said in a notice it was removing outmoded regulations on telegraphs effective in November to further our goals of reducing regulatory burdens, eliminating unnecessary rule provisions, and making the agency as efficient and effective as possible. There are close to 1,000 pages of FCC media regulations alone. AT&T Incorporated, originally known as the American Telephone and Telegraph Company in 2013, lamented the FCC's failure to formally stop enforcing some telegraph rules. Regulations have a tendency to persist long after they've outlived any usefulness, and it takes a real focus and effort to ultimately remove them from the books, even when everyone agrees that it's the common sense thing to do, AT&T said. 
The telegraph was demonstrated in 1838 in New Jersey and by the 1860s was widely used in the United States, making the first communication that traveled faster than a physical message. Telegrams were popular in the 1920s in part because they cost less than a long-distance phone call. FCC Chairman Ajit Pai said in May he wanted to remove outdated rules, striking irrelevant regulations as just a good matter of housekeeping and others that stand in the way of innovation and investment that would benefit consumers. Also in May, the FCC voted to start a comprehensive review of media regulations. Amateur Radio's two newest bands came to life on Friday the 13th. Both 630 meters, 472 to 479 kilohertz, and 2200 meters, 135.7 to 137.8 kilohertz, now are available to radio amateurs who have notified the Utilities Technology Council, or UTC, of their intention to operate and did not hear anything back during the ensuing 30 days. Utilities Technology Council emails went out to an undetermined number of U.S. radio amateurs who would notify the council, but not everyone got a thumbs up. One of those thwarted in his hopes of operating under his amateur radio license on 220 meters was John Andrews, W1TAG, a long-way veteran with thousands of hours on the band during the past 15 years under his FCC experimental license. Andrews, who also participated in ARRL's 630-meter experiment, said the UTC denied his request because he was within one kilometer of a power line that was using power line communication. He plans to request approval for 630 meters. According to reports, 630 meters has been the most active of the two bands, with plenty of CW and digital signals. On October 17th, W7IUV and VK4YB completed a JT9 contact, possibly the first U.S. to DX contact between two radio amateurs on 630 meters. Elements of the U.S. Department of Defense will conduct a communications interoperability training exercise November 4th through the 6th, once again simulating a very bad day type scenario. Amateur radio and Mars organizations will take part. For more details on this exercise, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from League Headquarters. During the exercise, a designated Department of Defense headquarters entity will request county-by-county -county status reports for the 3,143 U.S. counties and county equivalents in order to gain situational awareness and to determine the extent of the impact of the scenario. Army and Air Force Mars organizations will work in conjunction with the amateur radio community, primarily on the 60-meter interoperability channels, as well as on HF NVIS frequencies and local VHF and UHF amateur radio repeaters. Again this year, a military station on the East Coast and the Fort Huachuca, Arizona HF station will conduct a high-power broadcast on 60-meter channel 1, 5330.5 kHz, on Saturday from 0300 to 0315 UTC. New this year will be an informal broadcast on Sunday on 13,483.5 kHz USB from 1600 to 1615 UTC. Amateur radio operators should monitor these broadcast for more information about the exercise and how they can participate in this communications exercise. This exercise will begin with a national massive coronal mass ejection event, which will impact the national power grid, as well as all forms of traditional communication, including landline telephone, cell phone, satellite, and internet connectivity, Army Mars Program Manager Paul English, WD8DBY, explained in an announcement. We want to continue building on the outstanding cooperative working relationship with the ARRL and the amateur radio community, English said. We want to expand the use of 60-meter interop channels between military and amateur community for emergency communications. And we hope the amateur radio community will give us some good feedback on the use of both the 5 megahertz interop and the new 13 megahertz broadcast channels as a means of information dissemination during a very bad day scenario. Contact English for more information or questions about this exercise. I'm speaking with Mike Corey. KI1U, the ARRL Emergency Preparedness Manager, who has just returned from Puerto Rico. And uh, welcome back, Mike. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That yeah, well, was quite an adventure. <laughs> what uh, what lessons have, have we learned from uh, this? You know, I think uh, there, there's a lot to be learned, but um, a couple of the things that, uh, that I came back with, uh, one is 
it, you know, it was pointed out that, uh, you know, this wasn't an Aries thing. It wasn't a an ARRL thing. It wasn't uh, whatever acronym you want to use. This has really been amateur radio's uh, moment to shine in many ways. I mean, it started with not just the Puerto Rican amateur radio community and the U.S. Virgin Islands amateur radio community and many other islands throughout the Caribbean, but the the way the amateur radio service all across the United States and really throughout North America has uh, stepped up during uh, what has been probably the busiest month of, of uh, any hurricane season in recent memory. So I, I think that is one thing that has really uh, come from this, is the amateur radio service definitely has shown its value uh, in the last month. The second thing is that as we put together this team to assist Red Cross, uh, and, and rather quickly, uh, having a team on standby may be a good idea because uh, going from a 24-hour period where the team didn't exist to uh, recruit vet and uh, and send some names over to the Red Cross uh, proved to be a challenge and uh, I think we, we we rose to the challenge but I think that we it's going to make us rethink the way we do major disaster response moving forward. I can imagine I had heard through back channels that uh, the American Red Cross was very happy with the assistance and the service we gave them. Yeah, actually, uh, before I left Puerto Rico, I had a conference call with Red Cross National Headquarters, and uh, they they were very thankful. Uh, they expressed their their pleasure with the the way the amateur radio operators uh, perform their duties. Um, it was uh, they, they were pleased, absolutely pleased, and and we're going to uh, work with them to refine this process. So if uh, something like this happens again, we'll, we'll be able to uh, to answer the call. Excellent, Mike. Thank you. BBC Director General Lord Tony Hall of Birkenhead on October 18th opened the new London BBC Radio Group's G8 BBC Amateur Radio premises, or shack, if you will, here in the U.S. at Broadcasting House the headquarters of the BBC. The shack is located in a small room tucked in the roof of Broadcasting House. On opening day, Lord Hall used G8BBC to send greetings to GB2RN aboard the HMS Belfast, which is moored on the Thames River. The G8BBC call sign originally was held by the Aerial Radio Group's BBC Club under BBC Engineering. The new group of radio amateurs and SWLs at the BBC are putting the finishing touches on its shack and antenna system on the roof. There are 28 current members, some of whom are BBC on-air talent. We are now testing on the air from our new shack and broadcasting house, the G8 BBC team announced on its QRZ profile page. Please listen and report our signal. Jonathan Kempster, M5AEO, is the G8BBC secretary and station manager. Listen for them on the air. QRZDX and the DX Magazine publisher and editor Carl Smith, N4AA of Asheville, North Carolina, died on October 20th. An ARRL member, he was 77 and had been a radio amateur and DXer for more than six decades. Smith and his late wife, Miriam, KB4C, bought the two publications' parent, DX Publishing, in 1997. Carl was a ham's ham, as he dabbled in many aspects of our great hobby, the Daily DX editor Bernie McClenny, W3UR, observed. He did a lot for amateur radio over the years. Licensed in Kansas City in 1954 as WN4YFT, later W0YFT, Smith served in the U.S. Air Force from 1958 until 1966. He became W4NQA after moving to North Carolina. From 1968 until 1970, he was on the ARRL headquarters staff and held the call sign W1ETU. When he moved to Virginia in 1970, he regained W4NQA and, after moving back to North Carolina, obtained N4AA in 1976. An avid DXer and at the top of the DXCC honor roll, Smith was inducted into the CQDX Hall of Fame in 2012. Smith was a member of the Potomac Valley Radio Club. 
he reestablished QCWA Chapter 145 for the primary purpose of establishing the Southern Appalachian Radio Museum, now the Asheville Radio Museum, on the campus of Asheville Buncombe Community College. He was also a longtime Roanoke Division Assistant Director. For many years, he was the owner and manager of Georgetown Communications, an amateur radio store in Asheville. In the 1970s, Smith was instrumental in the formation of the Western Carolina Amateur Radio Society and served a few terms as president. Through W Cars, he instituted the annual Asheville Hamfest. W Cars became a volunteer examiner coordinator in the 1980s. He also established the KB4C Miriam Smith Award in memory of his late wife. The award presented annually by the ARRL Roanoke Division honors an amateur radio operator from Western North Carolina who has demonstrated an active commitment to public service and emergency communication through Aries Races. Smith was among the founders of the Southeastern DX and Contesting Organization, W4DXCC Convention, and his wife's call sign is used on the air at the annual convention and for various operating activities. An out-of-control space laboratory is falling towards the Earth and will crash on land soon, experts say. Engineers lost contact with the space laboratory last year, and it has been gradually falling back to Earth ever since. The Chinese space station is accelerating its fall towards us and will reach the ground in the coming months, Harvard astrophysicist Jonathan McDowell told The Guardian. It is decaying quickly, and he expects it will come down a few months from now, late 2017 or early 2018, he told the paper. The Tangwang-1 station was launched in 2011 as one of the great hopes of the Chinese ambitions in space and as part of a plan to show itself off as a global superpower. The country's space agency referred to the station as the Heavenly Palace and conducted a range of missions, some of which included astronauts. In contesting news this week, the often elusive Northern Territories, multiplier for ARRL's November sweepstakes, will be on the air this year as Jerry Hull, W1VE, takes the helm of VY1AAA, remotely operating the station of J. Allen, VY1JA, in Yukon Territory. Hull and Allen have done a lot of work on the system on their respective ends of things. J. has done a lot of work on the station, moving it to an outer building, so it does not bother him while he's operating, Hull told ARRL. The quad has been strengthened. A 160-meter double L with a 70-foot vertical section has been installed. He also said the alpha linear has been repaired. There is a remote antenna switching and azimuth control, plus small changes in the station to improve reliability. Allen has been working on station wiring, too. Hull shipped Allen a 500-foot roll of coax cable over the summer, along with many coax connectors and other odds and ends. A sweep may be heard. Given the conditions of the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico all allowed, he said the VY-1 station will be active in the ARRL 160-meter contest in December 2. He pointed out that all VY-1 AAA remote operators must hold Canadian advanced amateur licenses. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bacaba, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You always hear me talking about uh, two-factor authentication, right? You know that that's important, right? You know it saved me particularly recently. Two-factor is uh, is taking passwords one step farther. The whole problem, <clears throat> and someday we'll solve this problem, but the whole problem, whether you're walking into a bank to cash a check or logging in to match.com or trying to you know pay for something online is what we call authentication, proving you are you. And if we had, boy, if we had a good way of doing this, 
life would be a lot easier and there'd be less identity theft and we wouldn't have to worry about Equifax and all that stuff. We need a good way. So the ways we have are imperfect. Primarily a password, right? You log in with a password to a website and that proves you're you. If you log into your Amazon account with your email and your password, you can then buy stuff. If you know your email and password, you can you can buy stuff and send it somewhere else. You can do all sorts of stuff. Problem with passwords, well, there are a couple of them. First of all, we have to remember them. And as passwords proliferated, it got harder and harder to remember them. So we made them easier and easier to remember. It's still the number one password in the world is one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the next number two is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> so that's, that's a little better. So because they're hard to remember. But easy to remember means easy to guess and easy to crack and bad guys have gotten so good because they have very fast computers and, and software design. They go through all, the first thing they try is the top 1,000 passwords. So, you know, they'd get into monkey one, two, three like that. And then they try all the dictionary words. By the way, now we're down, we've gone for a few seconds. And then the rest of the minute or two is spent trying other things. So if, unless your password is long, long is good. We've talked about that before. Longer the better. And random uh it's eventually it'll be cracked if you do some dictionary words if you if you use your mother's maiden name and your birth date eventually that those are weak passwords the what's wrong with a very long 24 character completely random password with upper and lower case letters and numbers and punctuation what's wrong with that you can't remember it you good luck and you can't remember one let alone 500 so, and I've told you this before, you, I'm sure you're doing it by now. You're using a password manager, right? That keeps track of all these long, weird passwords. You remember one long, weird password. That's all you have to remember to unlock your password vault. But the rest, it's they're generated by and kept track of in a password manager. That's good. That solves a lot of problems. That's better than nothing. The next step, though, is to add a second factor of authentication. So there's three factors Computer and security geeks like to think of these three factors. Something you know, something you have, and something you are. Know, have, are. Something you know is your password. Yeah, only you know that, one hopes. Something you have would be, have you ever seen those pass keys? You know, when you get into a door or there's pass keys that generate numbers. The Bloomberg terminals, for instance, are, are protected by a password, but also a card that has that generates new numbers every 30 seconds, a one-time pass. That's something you have. You have to have that card. Something you are is your fingerprint, your iris scan. It's your it's biometrics. Two factor is two factors, two of those three factors. And so two factor is fantastic because, well, and I'll tell you how it saved my bacon. I use two factor everywhere I can. My bank, for sure. Facebook, Google, Twitter. And, uh, the two factors saved me at Twitter because somebody had hacked my domain registrar. No fault of my own, it turned out. There was a flaw in their software that they, they caught, fortunately, and they called me. They hacked it. And what they did, which is a very clever hack, is I have my email go to the registrar, and then it bounces off the registrar and goes over to Google, goes to my Gmail account. Boing. What they did is they got into the registrar, and they did this to a bunch of people, a lot of podcasters for some reason, and they, and they changed... They didn't change. Actually, they added a second email redirection. So, boing, it's going to my Gmail. And then, boing, it's also going to the hacker. Why do they do that? Well, because then they go to Twitter or my bank or Facebook and say, I forgot my password. Would you send me a new one? Now, I'm going to get that because it's going to go boing to my Gmail, but it also goes boing to the bad guy. I don't even know it, right? So the bad guy then immediately went to Twitter and said, I forgot my password. I know because I got an email saying, oh, you forgot your password? Click this link to reset it. But he got that email also. He clicked the link to reset it. And then, <laughs> oh, no, two-factor authentication. He didn't Twitter text message me a six-digit number. He couldn't get that number, and he couldn't log in. He couldn't change everything, and I, safe, discovered, you know, the well, my registrar called me and said, mm -hmm. this, <laughs> and they discovered it, they fixed it, and I went, Whew, glad I have second factor. In fact, some people did not and got bit by this guy. Who cares about Twitter? Maybe that was all the guy was interested in. Probably the next step would have been to go after bank accounts and, and things like that, Amazon. But I turn on two-factor everywhere. There's a problem well, with the two-factor that, that Twitter uses, and it kind of bugs me. They send you a text message to your phone. If a really determined attacker 
wanted to get you, he would get your password, but then he would also call your phone company and say, I lost my phone. Can you send me a new SIM card? What's your address? Well, I've moved to... <laughs> And this happens all the time. And they get a new SIM card. Now they have your phone number. Now when the text message comes in, they get it. They get it. And all of a sudden, two-factor didn't help you. That's, by the way, a bad way to do two-factor. Well, Google, all of this is a roundabout way to talk about Google's advanced protection, which they just launched this week. For people like, oh, I don't know, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee or a movie star like Jennifer Lawrence, if, if people are targets to bad guys... They can turn on the extra super duper protection. Then to log into any of your Google services, this is free by the way, but it's also a, a burden. So I'll tell you what the burden is. You, to log into any Google service, you have to not only have your password, but you have to have something that you have, a, a mechanical electronic dongle. You don't have to have just one. You have to have two for Google. Uh, I have a YubiKey which is a little USB thing you stick in, you press a button, it generates every 30 seconds a new, very long password, second factor of authentication. They, you also have to have a USB dongle, and that's for the iOS devices. And nothing else works. You can't say, send me a text message instead, or, oh, just let me in for this one time because I lost my key. You lose the key, you lose your account, and there's a very arduous process to get it back. This is called Google's Advanced Protection. It's a great idea... But they also don't allow any third-party applications to use a Google account. It really locks it down. I like it. I think it's great to have this choice. I turn it on. I'll probably turn it off again because I can't use any, <laughs> anything. And I'm definitely afraid of losing my key. But I think it's a great idea. And I wish more would do it, especially my bank. Boy, I spent too long explaining two-factor, so I didn't get enough time to explain the, uh, the real disadvantage. The initial disadvantage is you can't use on your iPhone, for instance, any – you can't use Apple Mail now. You have to use Gmail. You can't use any non-Apple – I mean non-Google products to access Google stuff because it won't authorize third-party apps. That's part of the security, right? But it means on your uh, – I mean, it's not so bad on an Android phone because you're probably all Google anyway. But on an iPhone, I can't use Apple's Mail program. I can't use Apple's Calendar program. I have to use all Google stuff. Problem two, which I hope they will fix, it doesn't work on Linux. Actually, maybe it does work on Linux. Well, maybe not. We're going to find out because I'm on a Linux box over here. But you can still access your email at home, right? So what you have to do is you have to use Chrome. You have to use Google's browser. And you authenticate with this key at home. And you only have to authenticate once on any given device. You know, it's one of those things where the first time you use it, you have to say, oh, yeah, I'm me. And they go, okay, fine. But that's potentially a problem because uh, if it doesn't work on Linux, which is about half of my machines. So let's find out. Let us find out right now. So, yeah, I don't, it did, I've tried it on two different Linux boxes. So you need, I need to sign in again. You are signed out of your Google account. Yeah, because I changed this thing. Now it wants the password. It knows who I am. That's good. By the way, I've had to stop doing my fancy mail routing as well. Because I couldn't. So I put in my password. And now the second factor. Insert. Now this is where it failed last time. Let's see what happens. Insert your security key. I have to go all the way over there. All right. I have insert. Yeah. Something went wrong. As soon as I insert it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Can't do it. As soon as you insert it, something goes wrong. You never can, uh, you never can get it going. <sighs> so it's the strong, <clears throat> yes, strongest security for those who need it most. Unless you're using Linux, then you're screwed. <laughs> so I think I'm going to end up turning it off because I need to. I need to use Linux. Another thing we talk about a lot on the show, and I'm sorry we have to talk about it again, is. Uh, is security flaws. The crack flaw with a K, K-R-A-C-K, is a flaw in the encryption your Wi-Fi uses. And uh, it's pretty serious. For a long time, we told you, uh, I've been telling you for 10 years, don't use WEP, WEP encryption on your Wi-Fi, because that's uh, insecure. It's been, it was cracked almost out of the box. Use WPA2. That's, oh, that's the good stuff. That's the gold standard. In fact, that's all you need to do to secure your Wi-Fi. Wrong, turns out. Mm-mm. It, uh, it has a problem. Uh, 
young young security researcher named Matty Van Hoff discovered that uh, you can. But what's interesting is, and I think this might be misrepresented sometimes in the media, it it's not your access point that's the problem, not your router. It's the things that connect to your router. You don't need to patch your router. You need to patch your phone, your laptop, the things that connect to the Wi-Fi, your internet cameras, your internet ovens, your internet doorbells. All of those things need to be fixed. If not, then somebody who is within range of your Wi-Fi sitting on your curb or next to you in the coffee shop can easily get in the middle and see what that device is sending back. Not such a big deal, you know, if it's your oven. <laughs> they can see what you're cooking. Might be a big deal if it's a internet-connected camera. They can see into your house. And certainly the traffic coming from your phone or laptop uh, on an access point, well, that we'd like to hide. And we thought we could. Although it's always been an issue, right, with open Wi-Fi access points. People have always uh, worried about that. And have, we've recommended the use of virtual private networks or VPNs. Those will protect you against the crack attack as well. And all this stuff is going to be patched. Turns out Windows and iOS didn't, didn't implement the WPA2 protocol quite right. And so they're not vulnerable. Still, they're getting patched. And even your router will probably get some patches. Most importantly, if you have one of those mesh routers... You know, the Eero and the uh, Orbi and the routers that have uh, satellites that they connect to, they're vulnerable because the satellites are clients. They're connecting to the router. So they're vulnerable as well. So you will want to look for patches. Look for Android updates too. Android needs to be patched. Not a nice one. Not a nice one. Uh, kind of a surprise even. Leo Laporte. The Tech Guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. The FCC isn't happy with Michael Dudley. According to the commission, he had admitted operating a radio station without proper authorization from his home in northern Alabama in 2016. It said he defended his actions then by saying the broadcast at 103.9 megahertz was not interfering with any other station, but he still had promptly shut down his pirate operation. And in fact, according to the FCC account, he voluntarily mailed his transmitting equipment to the FCC's Atlanta field office in a show of contrition. However, several months later, field agents responded to another complaint about another unauthorized station at 107.9 megahertz, emanating from his residence in Guntersville. On that recurrence, the FCC says Dudley's response was different. Mr. Dudley admitted he was operating another unauthorized station and refused to turn it off. Agents visited Dudley's residence on July 18th and confirmed that an unauthorized station was being operated at that residence. No one responded when the agents knocked on the door, but Dudley contacted one of the agents later in the day and admitted again he was operating a station without a license, according to an FCC order released this week. The Enforcement Bureau noticed, issued a notice of apparent liability against Dudley in October, and proposed a forfeiture of $15,000. Dudley responded to the NAL, the FCC said, but refused to pay. Although he does not deny operating the station, Dudley does make a number of arguments as to why the NAL should be canceled and the forfeiture reduced or rescinded. Specifically, Dudley argues that he had ceased operating the station, that the station had not caused interference and so had harmed no one, and that he is unable to pay the forfeiture. Now the commission has upheld the forfeiture of $15,000 and dismissed his reason for not paying. The FCC was unpersuaded by his argument and said it based its decision at least partly on the fact that he had resumed broadcasting just months after shutting down the first attempt. That he changed transmitting frequencies only shows that he intended to invade the commission detection, the staff wrote. The commission's enforcement arm has renewed efforts against radio piracy since Chairman Ajit Pai has elevated to chairman, and recently it began including property owners and landlords of expected pirates into its enforcement policy. Dudley now has 30 days to pay the forfeiture, or the case could be referred to the U.S. Department of Justice for enforcement of the forfeiture, according to the FCC order. It becomes hard to track how many such cases are pursued further. A common complaint among broadcasters worried about illegal operators is that the pursuit of conviction of the alleged illegals is either rare or happens out of sight. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, October the 27th. Our planet is still relentlessly plowing through streams of solar particles being spewed from a large hole in the sun's atmosphere. 
As the particles slam into our atmosphere, they trigger geomagnetic storms, and these have raised havoc on the HF bands, particularly on 30 meters and up. We had some strong storms over the last few days, and they're likely to appear again over the weekend and perhaps into next week. Two spots have made an appearance on the sun, but neither is expected to produce solar flare, so at least we have that to be thankful for. As usual, 40 and 80 meters during the nighttime hours are probably your best bets over the coming weekend. On VHF, central and southern California may be the hot spots for tropospheric ducting over the next few days, but VHF enthusiasts in the Great Lakes should be on alert as well. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. Rad FXSat or Fox 1B is less than two weeks away from launch, November 10th to be exact. Rad FXSat is a partnership with Vanderbilt University ISDE and has four payloads on board. They will study the radiation effects on commercial off the shelf components. There's an FM repeater with an uplink on 435.250 MHz with a 67.0 Hz. CTCSS tone and a downlink on 145.960 megahertz. Next week I will have more interesting news from the AMSAT annual symposium taking place this weekend. The first being Barry WD4ASW, AMSAT's president for the past nine years, is stepping down and a new president will be elected. Thanks to AMSAT News Service for this week's stories. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. Foundations of Amateur Radio. In the past, I've talked about what kind of station I have, how I tend to operate, and what kind of tools I use in my day-to-day -day running of an amateur radio station. This week, I want to take a closer look at what I do when I participate in a contest. I remember fondly the first contest I ever set up for. Fondly as in, what was I thinking? Let me set the scene. I'd previously been to a few stations that were participating in a contest. Some of those were in a club shack, others were set up portable in the field. For my first contest, I was going to set up my station in the field, so I needed to bring everything myself. Fortunately, I was with friends, one with a camper trailer, so I didn't need to bring a roof or the kitchen sink, but I did bring pretty much everything else. My list included tables, chairs, antennas, radios, headphones, connectors, soldering iron, power boards, extension cables, logbooks for paper logging, pens, clipboards, two computers, four spare batteries, power supplies. It took hours of preparation, packing and not to forget lugging. And when the contest was all done and dusted, I noticed that while I brought everything, I didn't bring the right things and some things were missing. For example, the little connector cable between the front face of my radio and the back of my radio was not packed. So I could only work with a long cable, which was subject to interference, which I couldn't fix because I didn't have any ferrites. Other missing tools were a multimeter, an antenna analyzer, and a dummy load, to name just the ones that come to mind today. A wise man once told me that the more you camp, the less you bring. Combined with my first contesting experience, that's become my motto, bring less. So last week, I packed much less and much more precise. My total packing list was a radio and a tuner, wire for wire antennas, crimp connectors and a crimper, a multimeter and antenna analyzer, a dummy load, barrel connectors and adapters from N to PL259, BNC and the like, a computer for logging and a cat cable, a headset, a foot pedal, a notebook and a pen. That's it, other than a toothbrush and a sleeping bag and warm clothes. As it was, my foot pedal didn't work because there was a fault in the adapter cable and I've added fixing that to my list of to-do items. Which brings me to the next thing I learned. It doesn't matter what you start with on your first contest. What matters is that you track it and then after the contest try to spend some time figuring out what worked and what didn't. If you update your list then over time it will become better and targeted to your specific circumstances. When I do a contest mobile from my car my packing list is similar but not the same. I've not yet got it down to a fine art but I'm getting better. One day I'll have the perfect kit. But then something unexpected is likely to happen and the perfect kit will change. Again, what is currently in your contesting list? What do you bring and what do you leave at home? What adventures did you have with your latest contest and what lessons could you share with others? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha, Bravo.
In late September, University of Alaska Fairbanks researcher Chris Fallon, KL3WX, was attempting to produce an RF-induced air glow or artificial aurora using the high-frequency active auroral research program, better known as HARP facility, near Gakona, Alaska, to warm up the atmosphere. Clouds hampered his experiment, but Fallon alerted his Twitter followers that he also had embedded a few slow-scan television frames in the powerful HARP signal, which were copied in British Columbia and in Colorado. The SSTV images, aside from being a fun way to engage hams in some sort of ionosphere heating science performed at HARP, will be useful for understanding radio propagation from Arctic or high-latitude sources, Fallon told the ARRL. HARP consists of multiple transmitters, feeding 180 phase arrays, is capable of producing 3.6 megawatts of RF. HARP signal is essentially aimed straight up. The assistant professor at UAF's Geophysical Institute transmitted two UAF logos, a photo of his cat appearing as a giant feline next to the HARP antenna field, a QR code granting the recipient .001 Bitcoin. The slow-scan TV images were not the best, and you almost need to use your imagination to make out the cat. The first slow-scan TV reception report arrived from Wall Salmanu in Victoria, British Columbia, using a Persis SDR Mixed W software and a north-directed corner-fed loop. The second slow-scan TV report arrived from Michael Coletta, KM0MMM, Pueblo, Colorado. His transmissions were on three discrete frequencies in the 2.8 MHz range. Fallon used different frequencies in antenna phase settings to determine if these factors would affect air glow. I used Scotty 1 encoding for the images because it is widely used in North America, and the 120-second duration fit nicely into the air glow experiment, Fallon said. The antenna was directed towards the HARP magnetic zenith, which is 75 degrees elevation is nearly vertical but has often been found by previous scientists to maximize artificial air glow. One factor affecting both the air glow experiment and the reception is that local F0F2 had dropped below the transmission frequency of approximately 2.8 MHz at the time of the experiment. He believes the British Columbia and Colorado reports came from the side lobes of HARP's primary beam. Fallon told the ARRL he still has some HARP time left from his September campaign, although he's not certain what he'll use it for. His next opportunity to experiment further won't be until early next spring. HARP conducts just two experimental campaigns a year due to staff and funding constraints. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. Some pointers for the new ham coming up. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, with the rain report for October 20th. It used to be when you turned the radio on and you came to Hambunchen 20 years ago, you couldn't get a word in edgewise. Every repeat, it was busy. People were talking. The intermod was tremendous. Now you hear nothing on the radio, and everyone's on the cell phones. What's that all about? The voice of veteran public service participant and inveterate contester, Mitch Stern, W1SJ, a perennial speaker at the Dayton Hamvention. While you may not agree with everything he says, his forum talks are a wealth of useful pointers for the new ham. His presentation at the 2017 Hamvention was no exception. I'm Mitch. I'm W1SJ. I've been doing this particular talk for a number of years because I'm a contester. I talk to a lot of people throughout the year, usually about seven, 8,000 people every year. And a lot of them like, don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Bust their own call sign. Phonetics, what are those? Those types of things. So maybe years ago I said, well, maybe if I taught people how to operate, I would increase my rates when I'm contesting. So I, I always have like kind of this uh, selfish reason why I do things. You know, I'm going to get some benefit out of this. So that's what we're going to talk about. But it's more than just contesting. It's just operating. And, and a lot of hams really don't operate much at all. Why should we be better operators? I don't have to be a better operator. I want to be a bad operator. Well, first of all, if you're a good operator, you get more enjoyment. You talk to more people, and it's easy. You're not sitting there struggling. Gee, I don't know how to talk to anybody. You know, I, I always have trouble making contact. And you make more contacts, obviously. We are looked up to as the radio experts. You know, they're, they're talking about, like, on the media here around Dayton, you know, all these radio experts are coming in here. They're going to teach us how to do amateur radio. They're going to save the day when there's a disaster. Well, we better know what we're doing because that's what we're supposed to be doing. If we get on there and we can't program up our Baofeng, what does that say? It says we maybe should have learned about that when we bought it. 
Hams have a public service mission. When all is said and done, at the end of the day, public service is really the most important aspect of amateur radio. It may, it may not be our most popular one, but it's the most important one because that's how we shine to the public. That's how we justify all those great frequencies that we have. And we need to be better to teach the new hams. Who teaches the new hams how to do this? You certainly don't learn it from the license manual. They just ask you a bunch of questions, right? You, we have to kind of show them, like, how it's done. So, what's the most important thing about being a great operator? Turn the stupid radio on. How many hams you know have call letter plates and the whole thing that says ham radio on the, on the side of the car and no radio in the car? What's the use of having call sign plates if you don't use your call sign? Or if you have the radio in there, well, it's broke, I need to fix it. Or it's, it's the wife's car. I, I'm not using the radio because it's the wife. Well, you know, I use the radio in the wife's car. I just put it in there when I use it. She doesn't like it, but I do it anyway. I had a whole, a whole HF station going in her car once. I just didn't show it to her. <laughs> You're not going to make any contacts with the radio off. If you can, that's a good thing. I mean, you're, you're pretty good at it, but really, you're just not going to do that. You need to have the station on. You need to leave it on and lose the stupid cell phone. Cell phones are like for business and for dealing with families and stuff like that. When you're on the radio, I don't want to know from the cell phone. Constantly, I'm talking to people. Well, hold on a minute. I got to take this call. If it's important, like for work, it's one thing. But people give out their cell phone numbers to everyone, and then they never have time to do anything else. I, I don't give my cell phone number out to anyone. You know, it's, don't, don't bother me. Call me when I'm home. So one of the techniques we use, listening is the number one skill. If you can't listen, you can't have the conversation. That's what is really important. I talk to a lot of people. Oh, yeah, name's Mitch, and this is my QTH, and ba 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 and dee 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 What did you say your name was? What'd you, what'd you call? And, and, like, I hate that. It's like, yeah, oh, I got to go. I don't like repeating myself. And, I mean, I know I'm full quieting into the repeater, so it's not a thing where the signal is just noisy. If you're not paying attention, then you have to be able to speak. And, and a lot of people just really can't do that all that well. And maybe that's why they should become CW operators. Some people are, are hampered by things like regional accents. Out here in the Midwest, you kind of like, you know, have that slight draw and kind of don't accentuate things. Whereas back east, we talk like rapid, staccato, high-speed type of data type of thing. You have to be able to be understood by everyone. So I'm in a contest, and I work a guy in Georgia, and I'm in the sweepstakes where you give that whole bunch of stuff, right, in sweepstakes. And I goes, whoa, whoa, slow down there. That's too fast for me. And I got to, like, slow it really down. Meanwhile, I'm, like, losing three and four contacts in the time it takes me to make this one contact. But that is his copying speed. So to make the contact, you have to have the right baud rate. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't work. If you are on CW, and you should be, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, make sure you key properly. Use uh, the keyer memory. If you're going to send with a hand key, make sure you can send your call sign right each and every time. So a guy will send me a call sign. It doesn't sound right. And I'll say, um, okay, send it. I'll say repeat, AGN again. And they'll send me the call sign, but it'll be slightly different. Now I'm not sure. I said, okay, let's go best two out of three. So I give them again, and then it's yet a different call sign. So now I don't know what the heck it is, you know, and, like, it just takes a long time. And that's just a call sign. So that, that's why you either use the keyer, you know, where you just push the button and it does it perfectly every time, or if you're going to do it by hand, which sometimes I do, you better be good about that and don't mess it up. Be a master of the frequencies. What that means is that you know where you got to be to talk to somebody. If it's on HF, you know where you're going to get propagation to. You're not going to try to talk to somebody from here, let's say to Indiana on 20 meters. Ain't going to work. That sort of thing. Or if it's on repeaters, you know which repeater you have to use to talk to somebody. That, you know, yeah, that's a little backyard repeater. That's not going to work. Pick this one instead. Set up a good station. Too many hams like to be minimalists. Save that for another day. Save that for when you're an experienced operator, that you know how to do this stuff. Because if you set up a low-powered station or one with a poor antenna, it's a lot more difficult to make contacts. Set up the good station, and then you can turn the power down once you got the contact made. Use the right equipment for the job. So yeah, a handheld running a half a watt is not the right thing to use if you have a key communications job in something where people may be dying in front of you and you have to ask for help and they go, what did you say? What did you say? You're breaking up. That's an idea of using the wrong equipment. Teach others to be good operators. If you do that, you will become a good operator. At least I hope. 
You, you should be. I hope you're teaching them the right things, certainly. And you practice. You don't just do it and forget about it. You practice. What amateurs bring to the table in, in all these public service events and emergencies is we do this all the time. Okay? The word amateur comes from the French. It's to love to do something. We love to do this stuff. We do it all the time. I often advise people who like to go sailing, oh, I want to put a radio on the boat. And I say, okay, now that you got your license, that's fine, but you've got to get on that radio every single day. Go check into the maritime net or do whatever. Why do I have to do that? It's because you want to be experienced. You want to be able to do that with your eyes closed. When you have a, a situation where you're in a storm and the mast is down and you're taking on water, that is a hell of a time to go looking for the instruction book. So your basic operating skills, listening, listen carefully for receiving. The information may be critical. Use a good speaker or headphones. So if you're using the speaker in your car radio without an external speaker, that's not a good speaker. That's a piece of garbage. It's like that big around and it doesn't reproduce sound very well. And unless you're driving like a real high-priced luxury car that's very quiet or you don't open windows, you're not going to hear anybody. So get yourself a good speaker or use headphones where it is allowed. Okay, you're not supposed to use them while driving. People, certain people like law enforcement get upset by that. But if you're not driving or walking, you should be using headphones virtually all the time. So in transmitting, you talk in short bursts, not monologues. Save the monologues or, you know, if you become a late night talk show host. Short bursts, one sentence at a time, one thought at a time. Don't use the word and or but. That's a good way to do it. If you keep saying and but, don't do that. First of all, if the person at the other end is like me and has an attention span of three or four milliseconds, they have forgotten what you're going to say. Keep it short and to the point. So you want to say the important information, avoid all else. So, so in the various public service events and marathons, I tell people, I want to know the who, what, when, where. I don't want to know anything else. I, I, don't, I don't want to know what you did, had for lunch yesterday or any. And people say that sometimes. Just the important stuff. If I need to know more information, I will ask. And then the other part is enunciate. Don't mumble. Slow down when needed, particularly if conditions are poor. Speak slowly and emphasize words. Makes a big difference. How many of you uh, used to listen to shortwave radio years ago with Voice of America where they used to have broadcasts in special English where they talk really slow? You think like, what are these guys, retards? How come they can't? Well, they're talking slow for, for foreign people who don't know English very well to be able to understand. But you understood every word they were saying. And one of the things that I've noticed is that when you listen to shows on TV or in the movies, and my parents used to always say this. My parents used to say, these people, these actors today, they always mumble. And she was talking about the Godfather movie. And I said, well, not for nothing, but you, like when you're going to get somebody killed, you don't like announce it in your best Shakespearean voice. You kind of say it kind of like under, under your voice a little bit. But I'm noticing now that I'm kind of getting up in age. I'm watching a movie, and I don't understand what the heck they're saying. They're talking too fast. They're mumbling. They're not projecting their voice. Notice when I talk like that, you hear it a lot better. That's what you need to do on the radio. It's not a telephone. Use phonetics on HF. Real, real important. If I say W1SJ on HF, it is a one in three chance you're going to get it right. You'll either say W1FJ, W1SJ, or W1XJ. And, and you really cannot hear the difference because the sound quality of of the single sideband radios that we use cuts off the frequencies that allow us to distinguish between those consonants. But if I say Whiskey One Sierra Juliet, remembering to roll the R's if I'm talking to someone who's Latin, because you have to do that, then they know what I'm saying. And if they don't understand that, they just say W1 Sugar Japan or W1 Stupid Jerk, but I don't use that a lot. <laughs> Think twice... Before you speak, have something to say. Okay, if you don't have anything to say, just say, eh, all right, uh, hold, hold on a minute, I'm standing by, you know, whatever. Uh, you really don't just ramble on saying, hey, there's a lot of traffic here on Fairgrounds Road. We know this. <laughs> We've all been stuck in it. Then there's the part called information. Take careful notes when listening. I mean, if it's, if it's a casual cue, so you don't have to do that. But I mean, if, if you're in it, some sort of event where you're passing information that matters, you want to take notes. Unless you have a memory as sharp as a whip where you can remember everything and then repeat it back. 
the problem I run into is you have to be able to write legibly. I take plenty of notes. I can't read them. You know, I guess you can use tape recorders or whatever, but that's a little bit hard to do. But you really have to be able to copy information down and give it to people when they need it. All right, so let's have some fun. Things that hams do on the air that drive me insane. And maybe some of you too. People who over-identify. So the FCC only requires us to identify every 10 minutes and at the end of the QSO. You don't even have to identify at the beginning. Someone says, who's that unidentified station? It says, you're not going to know for the next 10 minutes because they don't have to tell you. <laughs> of course, it's a bunch of buddies of mine. They know who it is. You know, they're, they're razzing me, and I razz them right back. You've heard people on the air. They, they identify like every minute or every transmission. It makes you insane. Like, shut up already. God, oh, here's your stupid call sign. And then they say, uh, for instance, because, uh, you know, there is a W1X, W1XXX for ID. Now, I have a question. If it's not for ID, what else would it be used for? Anything? I, I think we've all kind of decided, yeah, it's for ID. So you just W1XXX. Right? And then this is an old thing. You know, there's like 14 people in there, and they're having a roundtable discussion, and they go W1XXX in the group. Well, I think we've figured that out. That is a group. That's one hell of a group. Just give you a call sign. Here's one that I go insane now, the abbreviation HI is meant for CW, because try as you may, you cannot laugh with a code key. I've tried it. Can't do it. So instead, you send HI on Morse code. Saying it on phone makes you sound dumb. Hi, hi. No, it's ha-ha, not hi, hi. None of this is really important, but I mean, when, when, if someone's listening to you, do you want to sound intelligent or do you want to sound weird? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Some people prefer to sound weird, you know, and I guess that's fine. All right, then they say, uh, W1XXX, on the side. No, the fries are on the side. You are standing by. To use the proper terms here. Then we have 73s. The abbreviation, if you look it up, is 73, singular. 73 singular means best regards. Now, if you say 73s, it really means best regardses. Is that what you want to say? The best one is 73rds. We, I don't hear that much anymore, thank God. 73rd, you know what 73rds is? 23 and a third. You reduce the fraction, that's what it comes out to be. And then you get the military types, when you, you ask them a question, they go, negative, 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 affirmative. It's like no works really good, it's one syllable. Which part of no don't you understand? It's no. Very easy. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need the negative. This one is, is, this is kind of a mixed one. People say, uh, call me on the landline or call me on the twisted pair. Actually, this makes sense now because that means that you're not talking about a cell phone. You actually are talking about a wired phone, which few people have. How many people have wired phones still? Okay, that proves that you guys are all old buzzards, right? Because <laughs> when I, I teach an electricity class and I ask students in the class, how many of you have an actual wired landline phone and it's like one or two hands out of a class of 10 and that number's been steadily dropping? So when I start talking about plain old telephone service and operators and stuff like that, they look at me like I have three heads. Let's just say telephone and we'll leave it to people's imagination as to whether it's wired or not wired. Here's another one I don't hear much about, which, which I'm relieved. Uh, the first personal here is, you ever hear that one? What's wrong with name? One syllable, right? Makes it a lot easier. And we are destinated. Destinated, that's yeah, not, not a verb, not an adverb. I've arrived. We went to the flea market yesterday and we bought a bunch of stuff and we did this and we, and you know, like the guy is like a widower and he's like not married and doesn't have a girlfriend, doesn't have kids or anything. This is the only person sitting in the car and we did this and we did that. Well, who's the other person? We got a mouse in your pocket. What, what do you, what do you mean by we? It's I, I did this. It's okay to say I, that's, you know, that's not rude. And then people use Q signals on FM. Now, yeah, if you want to talk about a QSL card, fine. But, you know, uh, QSY or, uh, you know, QTH, just use the regular English words. The Q signals are meant for Morse code, not for phone. And that concludes our first excerpt of two from a 2017 Dayton Hamvention talk by inveterate contester and public service guru Mitch Stern, W1SJ. We'll hear some of his pointers for new hams participating in public service events next time. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, bidding you very 73. Most radio amateurs are only active on the bottom 30 megahertz of the entire radio spectrum, which covers in total 300,000 megahertz or 300 gigahertz. 
Fortunately, many amateurs also experimented on the VHF and UHF bands, while only a few ventured to explore the SHF and the EHF bands up to 241 gigahertz. Radio astronomy, military, commercial stations, either terrestrial or satellite, as well as scientists have investigated and or occupied frequencies in the microwave spectrum. The top end of the microwave radiation overlaps the bottom end of the deep infrared radiation. And for years, nobody paid much attention to this terahertz gap that covers 1 terahertz to 10 terahertz until they stumbled on the unique properties of this submillimeter radiation. It was with great difficulty that they first produced a few milliwatts of power on terahertz. Water vapor in the air normally limits communications to about 10 meters, but it is not a problem in space or for high-altitude sites such as infrared telescope in Alma, Atacama, Peru. Terahertz can see through walls and is a substitute for X-rays without its radiation hazard, including many other uses. Radio amateurs have also pioneered two-way contacts in Germany and the USA above 400 gigahertz, up to a distance of 1.4 kilometers. During the World Radio Communication Conference scheduled for 2019, frequency bands will be allocated from 275 to 450 gigahertz to the different radio services, including amateur radio. CW operators are fond of saying that CW is the mode that gets through when all others fall short of the mark. Digital aficionados may disagree, but CW did the job for Chet Hogue, N3BK, who handled some 80 messages for residents of Florida's Lower Keys in the days following Hurricane Irma in September. The Summerland Key Charter Captain, known as Captain Chester, weathered the storm in place. He noted that the primary frequencies handling traffic were quite busy, so he got on CW, which allowed him to relay messages clearly. He operated from a station at his home as well as from his boat. Hogue would transmit message traffic gathered from residents trying to get in touch with family and friends outside the area. Hogue used a 100-watt radio run from Deep Cycle Marine Batteries and a G5 RV and fiberglass vertical on his charter boat, keeping a handwritten log on a piece of cardboard. A new scholarship is available to radio amateurs. The New England Amateur Radio Festival, or NearFest Memorial Scholarship, administered by the ARRL Foundation, commemorates NearFest team members who have become silent keys and is intended to provide funding toward the educational expenses of a currently licensed amateur radio operator who is pursuing a post-secondary education. Applicants must be U.S. citizens or permanent residents, reside in the ARRL New England Division, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island, Connecticut, or Massachusetts, and have held an amateur radio license for at least one year prior to the date of application. Preference will be given in descending order of license class as well as to applicants pursuing full-time studies at a four-year undergraduate degree-granting institution, pursuing postgraduate studies with any degree, or enrolled in radio communications at a two-year technical school. The initial scholarship will be awarded for the 2018-2019 academic year. Scholarships are for the exclusive use of the winner to be applied to tuition, books, mandatory fees, on-campus housing, and other bona fide educational expenses. The ARRL Foundation is currently accepting applications from eligible radio amateurs pursuing higher education. More than 80 scholarships ranging from $500 to $5,000 will be awarded in 2018. All applicants must submit a completed online application. Transcripts are due by February 15, 2018. For Joe Craig, V01NA in Torbay, Newfoundland, things have been pretty exciting lately on VLF. He's among the early medium frequency, low frequency, and VLF experimenters in North America, active even before Canada allocated amateur radio bands in that part of the spectrum. He believes he accomplished a first for a Canadian radio station on October 22nd when his very low frequency, very QRP signal on 8.27 kilohertz on the 36 kilometer band was copied in the UK. After much effort on both sides of the pond, shortwave listener Paul Nicholson in Tord Morden finally copied a three-letter message he told ARRL. It's the lowest frequency transatlantic message made possible because of Paul's eb not coherent BPSK mode and DL4YHF's Spectrum Lab Spectrum Analyzer. Even more amazing, the power was 10 microwatts ERP. 
Craig is permitted to run 10 milliwatts by regular ISED Canada, formerly Industry Canada. The transmission path was more than 3,500 kilometers, or approximately 2,170 miles. VLF signals have been copied across the Atlantic in the past. In March of 2014, a very low-speed QRSSCW signal on 29.499 kHz, transmitted by Bob Raid, W2ZM, a New York experimental licensee, initially was detected in the UK by Nicholson. In June of 2014, Dex McIntyre, W4DEX in North Carolina, transmitted an ebb naught signal on 8.971 kHz while running on the order of 150 microwatts ERP. Nicholson detected that signal, too. McIntyre needed no FCC license to transmit on the 8.971 kHz because the Commission had not designated any allocations below 9 kHz, dubbed the Dreamers Band. Craig's transmission from Newfoundland began at 2300 UTC on October 22nd and ended seven hours later. Paul replied via email the following day with the correct message, Craig said, and there's been much rejoicing across the pond and in the Marconi Radio Club of Newfoundland. Craig said that Nicholson had detected a carrier from VO1NA in the past spring, but it was not stable enough to send a message. DL4YHF Spectrum Lab and a GPS module output signal was used to calibrate the computer and help from DF6NM and DK7FC. Worked much better, Craig said. Paul measured the phase for a few days before the message was sent. With a new high-stability carrier, Paul got me on the first call. The final stage of his VLF transmitter is what Craig described as the Very Canadian Trainer Group 1 slash SC stage amplifier from the 1970s. He says his is the only known VLF transmitter in Newfoundland and Labrador. His antenna, by the way, is approximately 100 meters long of number 12 copper wire, about 12 meters high on the average. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Reinvention of Amateur Radio Lack of growth and how to make amateur radio attractive and relevant to young people is on the minds of many International Amateur Radio Union, IARU, member societies, including the Wireless Institute of Australia, the WIA. A common practice is for many organisations to reinvent themselves about every 10 to 20 years. In Australia, we introduced the limited license and then the novice and later the foundation license. These responded to the need for reinvention in their era. That time has come again, only more quickly driven by the exponential growth in technology. A few years ago, the WIA began work with the regulator, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, ACMA, to plan a future for amateur radio. Recently, the WIA consulted widely on the Future Licence Condition Determination, LCD. A new LCD could remove the barriers that hamper existing and future technologies, also broaden amateur radio to make it the obvious choice for tech-savvy young people. At the recent IARU Region 1 General Conference, member societies in Europe, Africa, the Middle East and Northern Asia held a workshop on the future of amateur radio. They discussed many things that the WIA has been exploring to make the hobby more attractive and relevant to today's technology-rich society. Discussion of the topic will continue in late 2018 at the IARU Region 3 for Asia and the Pacific under the theme of attracting youth to amateur radio. The WIA agrees with the two challenges that came out of the Region 1 workshop, increasing the inflow to amateur radio, particularly from young people, and making member societies the must-join organisations for all radio amateurs. A clear message is that attracting young people needs to be led by young people. This meant that the use of Twitter, Facebook and other social media, for example, must be driven by young people. At the Region 1 conference, visiting IARU Region 3 director Peter Young, VK3MV, spoke about the school amateur radio club net, showcasing its website, www.sarcnet.org, as a resource centre. He also mentioned the STEM, 
science, technology, engineering and maths, connection to amateur radio and how radio amateurs can assist teachers in schools with the technical details and leave the teaching to the professionals. The WIA may consider that things like experimentation, research and pioneering, things amateur radio was widely known for once but now overshadowed by techno information overload, could be revived with a broader modern appeal for the hobby. At the same time, amateur radio has to be fun, a way of learning in a classroom setting and through self-learning, and broadened to embrace pursuits such as IT wireless, radio astronomy, radio control, mesh networks and the like. The Australian Government's support of innovation, the STEM initiative in education, the newly launched National Space Agency, as well as existing maker activities, are all potential pluses for amateur radio. With those dynamic potential changes, amateur radio could be a larger and meaningful part of the community, instead of retreating to a fading thing of the past. And finally this week, drones are getting a presidential thumbs up as President Donald Trump has directed Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow to launch the Unmanned Aircraft System Integration Pilot Program. The new initiative will test and validate advanced drone operations in partnership with state and local governments in select jurisdictions. The result will be used to accelerate the integration of drones into the national airspace and to realize their benefits in the economy per the U.S. Department of Transportation's official announcement. The program is designed to provide regulatory certainty and stability to local governments and communities, drone owners and operators who are accepted into the program. For the USDOT and the FAA, the program is seeking to develop a regulatory framework that will allow for more low-altitude operations, identify ways to balance local and national interests, improve communications with local, state, and tribal jurisdictions, address security and privacy risks, and accelerate the approval of operations that currently require special authorizations. Specific operations that are expected to be evaluated as part of the program include night operations, flights over people, flights beyond the pilot's line of sight, package delivery, detect and avoid technologies, counter UAS security operations, and the reliability and security of data links between pilot and aircraft. The USDOT will publish a Federal Register notice with additional details on applications and how the program will work in the coming days. After evaluating all applications, USDOT will invite a minimum of five partnerships to take part in the program. Meanwhile, an FAA advisory panel on drone regulations is split on whether to implement rules on tracking and identifying drones. According to the Wall Street Journal, the committee agreed that adequate tracking technology currently exists or could be developed rapidly, but couldn't agree on what categories of drones should be covered under remote monitoring rules. The committee, made up of more than 70 industry, labor, and security experts, drafted and submitted its non-binding report to the FAA, which has not been released to the public. Objections about the drone rules appear to stem from security officials' concerns over the ability to track drones that could be used in potential terrorist attacks. The use of drones in a variety of sectors from agriculture to defense to news gathering by local stations and especially for emergency and relief efforts and news gathering has gained more traction in light of the recent hurricanes in Texas, Florida and the Caribbean. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, amateur radio newsletters from around the world, sources on the Internet, and the packet bulletin board systems of the United States and Canada. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. 
You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.